Vinnie Tolman was dead for 45 minutes. For three days, he was brain dead in a coma. What he experienced during that time not only challenged his previous belief system, but completely changed the way he walks through the world. He's come back with some profound lessons that I hope will inspire you as much as they have myself. Enjoy the conversation with Vinnie Tolman. Thank you so much, Vinny, for uh, being here with me today. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to hang out with me and to have a chat. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure, David. That's totally my pleasure to be here. Before we go into your story, I wanted to ask you who you were before your NDE. What did you believe and how would you describe yourself? I was very much kind of your testosterone situation. I, I was kind of thinking like I was always proving myself. I was raised in, in a bit of an abusive home uh, physically. And uh, so I had kind of a chip on my shoulder for men, especially. Mm -hmm. And anybody who wanted to, you know, bump my shoulder, I was kind of looking out for a fight back then. And whether it was, you know, a bump on the shoulder, or somebody cutting me off, whatever it was, I was I would, I would definitely classify myself as a hothead, uh, almost like I had something to prove, even though um, I had already spent, at this time when this happened, I had already spent two years uh, service, you know, serving the, the people in Southeast Asia on a service mission. Um, and that was really awesome. That was a very precious time in my life. But it seems like that was like the, the higher side of my life. And, and I was back in the ego space, the low low frequency space of uh, living in the world and living of the world. It was, it was very self-destructive and, and people around me knew it. So they, they didn't think I was long for this world and I kind of didn't either uh, the way I was living. So um, yeah, but, but those who do know me still and, um, and my buddy that I was with when this happened even says that, you know, you're different now and I am different. I'm very different now and not just because I'm married and have kids, but, but I'm very different as a human being. Uh, my priorities are very different than they were before this. What was your faith like before this? What did you believe in? Did you believe in God? Did you not believe in God? I grew up a uh, evangelical Christian and and very in a very strict Christian home. I mean, even to the point where um, I was joking with a, a friend of mine the other yesterday that in my home on Sundays, you had to wear, you had to stay with your Sunday clothes on all day, like until the very end of the day. And that, that wow. kept you from going out and like getting your clothes dirty and playing in the dirt and whatever as a kid. Um, so we, we were, you know, kind of the strict adherence to the law of Christianity or the rule of Christianity. And so, um, you know, being raised in that on the surface, we were really good, you know, Christian family. But what did go on behind closed doors, which it happened in a lot of homes back then, um, some really heavy handed discipline and really heavy handed um, treatment of us as kids. And um, and yeah, so it 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 kind of built me to be this person who, yeah, I was I was raised in this framework. But the second I moved out, I was out of it, completely out of it. And and I walked away for a couple of years, then came back to it on my own went and did my service mission for a couple of years. Um, and then kind of had a second walking away where I had to rediscover my own faith and, and in doing so I actually had my death. And, and it's the weirdest thing to say, but I had to die to learn how to live. I had to die to learn the right way to live. Uh, for me, that's what I had to do. And, and if, I, if I didn't learn it, I was gonna end up going that way anyway. I, I feel very strongly. Wow. Yeah. So you had your own death and resurrection right there. Yeah. So let's go into your story. What happened? Well, uh, back then I was, uh, I was training to, to, you know, enter, uh, amateur bodybuilding competitions with my buddy. He had, he had already entered a couple and he was getting me into it. So we were working out all the time. Uh, we, you know, sometimes working out two or three times a day, uh, for an hour or two each time. And in doing so, we were, we were kind of testing a lot of different supplements that are available at that time. And in doing so, we found one supplement that became very popular. It allowed you to work out your same group of muscles every day without alternating days. 
And so you could get your build, your, 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 your bulking and your massing a lot quicker than you could in a traditional scenario. So for bulking up for, for bodybuilding, it's, it's perfect. And uh, in doing so, we, we tried to find it at GNC at all these different vitamin shops. Everybody was sold out. We were on the wait list for like three months for all these different shops. None of it was showing up. It was all going out the back door of the shops with the employees essentially. And uh, finally, we found a company in Thailand that was selling it online. And so we figured, hey, let's try this stuff. You know, I had lived in Thailand for a few months in my life. So I was like, hey, this is pretty cool. Um, I trust, you know, the kind of the food and drugs from, from Thailand and, and it's a supplement. So let's, let's take it on. So we ordered a, a jar of it or a bottle of it. And this is a liquid supplement. You take a little bottle cap of it before you go work out. And then uh, the next day, do another bottle cap before you go work out. And we got it. We took our bottle cap, our normal dose. And what we didn't realize is in this, this Thai version or this Thailand version, it had, it was made as a hundred percent solution. And the solution in the United States was a 5% solution. So it was like taking 20 bottle caps worth. Wow. And it was way stronger than, and we tasted it. Like as soon as we took it, we were like, oh, that tastes a little different. It tastes like normal. Like it tasted somewhat normal, but not. It tastes a lot stronger. We both realized it both at the same time. We both took it, took it, you know, and, and realized, whoa, this is different. This feels different even already. And, and, you know, learning, working with different supplements, sometimes you just need to get a good, a good meal in you and that'll kind of counteract any of these, you know, funky supplements, that kind of stuff. So we decided, Hey, let's go down the street. We'll get a bite to eat. And that's going to take care of things, uh, you know, make you feel better. And so we did, we went down the street, but on the way I started noticing my buddy, he was, he was sitting there driving with both hands on the wheel and he started dozing off already. And and I'm like, what is going on? I was like shaking him, like, stay awake, stay awake. And trying to keep him awake as we pulled into this, this little fast food restaurant. It was actually a Dairy Queen, pulled into this Dairy Queen. And, um, and it was just down the street from his place. So it was, the, it was the closest place we could get to. We got there. As soon as we got there, though, I, as soon as he put it in park, I knew he was going to be okay, at least for, you know, dozing off or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I felt it hitting me like that. And I just, I didn't want to, I'm a very private person with my, my vulnerability because of my past. And I didn't want to be collapsing out on the street or vomiting out on the street right there. So I went running in, went into the bathroom and it was a single use bathroom. So I locked the door, you know, out of habit. That's mm -hmm. what you do in those bathrooms. Right. I locked the door. And um, as soon as I got in there, the, the whole, the whole world felt like it was spinning on me. Just like how the movies do it too. It's just like that. The whole world felt like it was spinning on me. And then I was out. I went completely blacked out at that point. Did you hit your head on anything? We actually checked when I, when, you know, three days later when I actually came conscious, we, I checked all over. I had no, no marks. I had a little bit of a um, kind of a larger goose egg on the back of my head. So I had to have hit it when I fell down. Mm -hmm. But I think the blackout happened from the supplement. Um, but I did, I blacked out whether it happened because I, you know, got dizzy and hit the floor and blacked out either way. I was unconscious on the floor. Meanwhile, my buddy, he stumbles into the restaurant, barely makes it in and collapses on the first booth closest to the door. And he starts vomiting all over the booth. Well, they, you know, the manager saw this happen. They called 911, hauled my buddy off in an ambulance and he was totally fine. He got out the, um, the very next morning completely fine they just pumped his stomach um and he was totally fine but meanwhile nobody knew there was two guys everybody thought you know this is just a single guy problem uh, meanwhile i'm in that bathroom and all of a sudden where i am i'm i now feel like i get plunged into like a it, it's kind of like uh this feeling of you know in vague I don't know if you've ever been to Vegas before. I live in Vegas. But yeah, I've been when you're in Vegas, Vegas and 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 it's really hot out and and it's so hot that when you jump in the hot tub, it actually feels cool. I mean, that's what it felt like. It felt like a warm but cool feeling. Just this plunge, literally a plunge, just like a, as if I jumped into like a hot tub or something like that. And I just felt completely surrounded by this energy. And 
then I started to come into focus this light that was in front of me. And this light that was in front of me started to form into what looked like a scene. And to me, I had actually had worked in TV and film in the past. It looked like a movie scene to me, but it was really weird. It was this movie scene being shot from like the ceiling view or looking down from above. Mm -hmm. And I'm just sitting here feeling comfortable, kind of feeling almost like I'm sitting in a seat, very comfortable though in this, this cool flowing energy. And I'm watching this scene play out in front of me. And the first thing I notice is I notice that, that there's this guy, he goes, um, they're, they're like struggling around him to clean him up, get him into an ambulance and take him off to, a, um, to the emergency services, to the hospital. And, and that was my buddy. I didn't recognize ne yet necessarily that it was my buddy yet, mm -hmm. um, but I was, I was very hopeful, like, oh, I hope they can help that guy. And, and I, I started to think like, oh, that looks like my buddy Rob. And, and I'm like, hey, I hope he's going to be okay. And um, then as I started to um, notice everything that is going on around, it was as if I could hear the thoughts and the feelings of everybody in the restaurant, literally everybody in the restaurant. So I'm going through this process of just just trying to figure things out, like what is going on? This is so weird. Why would I be watching a movie where I'm hearing everyone's thoughts all at the same time. And then I realized that I could perceive if I wanted to, I could pick out individual people's thoughts, what they were thinking and feeling. And so I started to perceive the manager and um, how he was just hoping this guy was going to be okay. And, and, you know, I guess it's not a normal Saturday. This is a, already off to a weird Saturday. And uh, he was also hearing like the voice of his mom in his head about some other things. And then all of a sudden I, I hear the, the thoughts of one of the patrons in the restaurant. And he's thinking like, why is this bathroom locked? Why is this bathroom locked? And he keeps going and trying to open this bathroom. And he tried three or four times. Finally, he goes to the manager and says, hey, I got to use the restroom. It's been locked for a long time. It's almost been an hour. Can you go open the rest, you know, the bathroom? And the manager goes over there, he knocks on the door, of course, no answer. He opens the door and sees, sees this dead body on the ground, literally a dead body. Um, he, he called his kind of his assistant manager, his first, first uh, assistant or whatever in this little restaurant, which was a girl, which she was probably like 16 or 17. He calls her over and he, 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 he's like, call 911. She comes walking over with the phone. She's already got it called, dialed into 911 uh, to emergency services. He picks up the phone. He's holding the phone while he directs her to like, hey, feel on the, in the, around the neck for a pulse, feel on the, the wrist for a pulse. Um, before, as soon as she touched the wrist though, she, that was the first thing she touched. She, or when she went to go to even touch the body, she felt it was cold already to her. It felt cold to her. So as soon as she said that, the manager told the, the operator on 911 and, and they said, you know what, don't touch the body if it's already cold, don't touch it, secure the room and wait for the, the ambulance to get there and let them deal with that, that, that body or that person. And so then the manager's, you know, I, again, hearing everything he thinks and he's feeling like, oh my gosh, this is such a horrible thing. How can I be even seeing this? I didn't sign up for this. So, you know, he's going through all this, these emotions. And again, he hears his mother's voice in his head again um, with some other stuff. And it's like, I'm experiencing all of this. And it's just very, very weird to me. And the oddest thing is it, it didn't seem like my body at all. I didn't even think that it was my body. And the reason why I didn't think is because me was literally up here watching. Me was up here above everybody in this weird movie space that I'm hearing everybody's freaking voices. And I don't know how I'm doing this. And I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking that it's even possibly me. And, and it's, it's odd to say that, but in the transition of things, it was not even possible. The only possibility was me was up here. And I was, see, I was looking at a dead body. Definitely, I remember the dead body. I still, like in my mind's eye, I can see it today. The skin was, had like very, very bright purple splotches and bright yellow in just the face. And then the neck had, had actually swollen up past the jawline. So oh. the, it's, it's, it's quite odd. And, and those who, I don't know if this is a normal thing with suffocation or what, but 
it was ugly. It was disgusting. And it looked, it looked so bad. It looked like a fake body job from a movie or something. It didn't look real to me. And I'm just sitting there thinking, um, this is so sad. I can't believe they found a dead body at this restaurant. This is horrible. And, um, and, you know, a few minutes later, it was, it was probably maybe five, 10 minutes later, an ambulance shows up, they come in, they, they try some preliminary stuff to try to resuscitate the body. Um, but they don't try for very long. It's only about maybe five minutes of trying. They give up pretty quick. Um, they go ahead and, and in due process, they bag the body. They put your body in a bag already? Yes. So I was, so the, the body was in the bag. It was strapped down like a dead body Whoa. and uh, put it in the back of the ambulance. But this, this crew that came, they had a brand new rookie. He was a, a greenhorn. It was his first week on the job. And he, I could hear his kind of his, his thought process or his, his monologue in his head was constantly saying like, why aren't we doing more? Why am I going through all this training? If I can't do more for this guy, I should be able to do more. And he didn't want to overstep his bounds, you know, being the new guy. But at the same time, he felt like they should have tried more. Like they didn't even bring out the, the much of their equipment or anything. They just used hand equipment and, and, and did some, you know, some preliminary CPR and such to try to, to try to bring back the, the body. But, um, you know, nothing happened. They, they just went ahead and processed the body, put it in that bag, put it in the back of the ambulance. And at this point, if you just go off of the time from them arriving and the first ambulance leaving with my buddy, um, that alone is 45 minutes. So they, we, we tend to think that I was gone for at least 45 minutes. But if, if you take into account um, the time that was waiting um, in between that, because they waited while I, they were there to sign paperwork. They were very thorough, this team, and they waited about another 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes in processing this, you know, the body. And they, they ended up having a police officer show up and they kind of traded paperwork, to the police officer. And, and um, then they, they left the scene after about almost an hour, about 50 minutes that they were there. So when you compound that 45 minutes plus the other 50 minutes, I was dead at least, I, I think more than an hour, but minimum 45 minutes dead. Um, that's wild. Danny. And, and, and yeah. all of this that you're saying, like, y it's so detailed that you were able to see all of this going on in the restaurant with the manager and, you know, the paramedics, were you able to talk to them afterwards and like, like verify everything that you had experienced? So, so right after the, this happened, the manager and the, the lady who was helping him and two others, they all four quit. So I did go back to try to say, hey, thank you guys. Just know that guy didn't die. Because mm -hmm. I, I didn't know if the, the medics came back and told them that they did end up reviving the body later um, or if anybody told them any of that. But I just wanted to come come say my piece and say thank you that I'm, I survived all of that. And and the manager, his other three underlings, all four were gone. Whoa. Um, the the one who was still there was the cook, but he didn't. And I remembered what he was thinking. He didn't want to talk about anything. Wow. Um, but yeah, and um, I did end up, you know, I think to me, to me, the true miracle is this rookie. The rookie is the miracle to me. Um, he's a Christian himself. Uh, he didn't feel like he had a strong connection to God. He felt he's connected to God but not a strong connection like some people do like pastors and, and youth ministers and ministers, but, but he was a, a great honorable man. And um, to me, he's the, he's, he's the real miracle because he's going along, he's sitting in the back of this ambulance and he's sitting there staring at this dead body. And he's like literally saying a prayer to God, like, why couldn't we try more? Why couldn't we do this? I wish we could have tried. And as he did that, his heart started to glow and this light, this light started to glow out of him as like this warm golden light. And I'm sitting here watching it. I'm like, how are they doing that? I kept thinking that, how are they doing that? Because literally it was glowing from inside his heart space wow. and it was glowing from inside. And, um, and I was, I'm just trying to figure this out. What's going on here. And then all of a sudden I feel this force, this very strong force go over me and pass me where I am watching, observing, 
and I feel the like the velocity of this energy go past me and I, I could actually see it make a connection to him and all of a sudden very loudly I heard and he heard both we both heard this one's not dead and I looked around I couldn't see anything behind me I couldn't I all I could perceive was like blackness or darkness behind me right mm-hmm. So I knew I'm like, well, I can't see where that came from. And so I'm trying to look around him. Like, did he hear that? Did he see that? I know he did because he was thinking about it. Are you still up, like floating above when you're? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So still watching, even even in the ambulance moving down the road, because they were in the ambulance moving down the road by now, mm-hmm. but they weren't going fast. They're just driving like mm-hmm. normal. Mm-hmm. And they had actually pulled up to a stoplight at this point when um, uh, a second time, now that the second time this glow, so this glow was starting with the heart and it started to expand. And as it expanded a second time, I felt this energy go over me, uh, literally just right past me. And almost like somebody's throwing something over your shoulder or over your head, you feel like something go past you. Mm-hmm. And for a second time I heard, but even louder the second time, this one's not dead. And when, when he heard it the second time, he didn't even didn't even hesitate. He started to try to um, figure out what was going on. He undid a a strap that was over the neck area. So he undid that strap. He unzipped the body bag. He felt around the neck, didn't feel anything. Um, He went and felt under the, under the arm, didn't feel any pulse. He undid a couple more straps and he felt down on the inner thigh where there is a big artery there. He was trying to see if there's maybe some type of warmth, some type of sign of life in in the big artery there as he made contact though and he was pushing to find that artery he made contact with my femur bone with the actual like skeletal bone and when he made contact with that bone i felt as if i got shocked like shocked like from a car battery or you know if you as a little kid if you put a fork into a, a a, an outlet uh-huh. i got shocked like that it was it, it jolted me wow. and i realized he felt it too because he froze where he was trying to feel for that 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 artery he froze he like froze for a second mm. but then that was enough it triggered all of his training he started the process of resuscitation he just started the whole process he ended up uh, pulling out a defibril- defibrillator. I have a hard time saying that. <laughs> um, he pulled that machine out that shocks the heart. Uh, defibrillator. I'm not even going to try, as... but I know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> he, he pulls this machine out or pulls out the, 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 the contact points. He puts them on the body. There's an alarm that goes off uh, before it actually shocks the body. Until this point, the other two medics in the front of the ambulance had no idea what was going on. So, you know, they had no idea he was doing all this until the alarm went off on this machine. Then uh, when that alarm goes off, they look back like, oh my gosh, you're an idiot. You're going to get fired. You got to stop this. You got to know when to quit. You got to know when to stop. You know, this is, they, they, they were like quoting all these laws that he was breaking and doing this, like, um, you know, you can't experiment on dead bodies. You can't do this. You can't do that. And um, he didn't care. He acted like he didn't even hear it. Wow. He went ahead and let that, that first charge happen. Nothing. He went ahead and did a recharge. On, this, on the recharge, one of the medics in the front, the one in the passenger seat, he started to come around to like try to manual, physically stop him from doing this. And as he was coming, like turning around to get out of his seat, the second charge hit the body and the second charge, it got one single heartbeat out of the body, one, but that one heartbeat was enough that it stopped that other, other tech from coming around. He actually sat back down and was like, whoa. And then the third round happened. And at the third round, there was a faint, but steady heartbeat. Whoa. It was steady. And so at this point, the body had been dead um, for quite a while. And this is a very uh, traumatic thing to happen to anyone, obviously. And um, the body started going through all sorts of weird things as right off the bat. Started going to seizures, going into weird, 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 you know, movements with the body and foaming at the mouth and, and 
gagging. And um, the, another miracle to all this is when the heart was started, they were a half block away from a hospital. Wow. Uh, li- literally less than a block from a hospital. So they, they were able to take me and turn and turn the body into Timpanogos Hospital, which is the hospital about a, a half a block from where the heart actually started. And, um, and still at this point, I have no idea. No idea what's going on. Just still watching everything, observing everything and experiencing everything, hearing all the, everyone's feelings and emotions, even these medics that were in the front, I could hear everything they were thinking. And as they were transferring the body from the, the, the gurney from the ambulance into the hospital bed to be treated and be worked on, as they're doing that, it, it was still going into seizures and all this kind of stuff. They were cutting body bag pieces off and, and trying, to, trying to you know get access to the body to work on it. And they decided they needed to um, like secure the body, keep it from you know flailing and, and wailing all around. So they put some straps on the, the legs. They strapped both legs down, then they strapped the right arm down. And as they went to strap the left arm, I actually felt someone strapping my left arm where I was sitting. And I felt it. I felt like someone was trying to restrain me. So I looked down to try to see what was going on with my left arm. And what I was seeing was the left arm of the body. I literally saw the left arm. Of the, and, and that's the first inkling that I had just witnessed my death and my resuscitation. And, um, and it just freaked me out. The, the first thoughts I had were, you're such an idiot. How could you not know? You just witnessed your own death. Wow. How could you not know that, you know? And that was pretty rough. I went into, I spiraled into a fear space. I can completely imagine. Completely surrounded. Yeah, because completely surrounded by what I call ego and fear and lower, lower voice, you know, of, mm. of self. And um, as I was just spinning into this, I, I had a flash of my past and my history, all the bad I ever did. And, and out of nowhere, this warmth started to warm me from behind. And then I started to see the good I'd ever done. And, and just real quick flashes, I could see all the good that I ever did. And, and not just that, I could see like the, the ripple effect, the, some people call it like the butterfly effect, where, where I was able to see what my good did and what that good rippled out to others. And I realized that, that I wasn't such an idiot, that I was worth keeping around and being around and being loved, most importantly. And this, this warmth just overcame me. And I started to feel love in a way that I never felt my whole life. I started to feel love come over me that it was like Niagara Falls pouring into my thimble of blackness that I had built into me. Wow. And I had all this darkness kind of traumatized into me as a kid. And it just immediately washed away in the most pure, unconditional light and love. And I, I use the word light quite a bit because to me, it's one and the same. The, that amazing, beautiful white light is the love I was feeling. And it just poured all over me, absorbed me. It overtook me. And I realized that all of this was coming from behind me, all of it. And for the second time I turned to look, the first time I turned to look, I couldn't see anything back there. But the second time I turned to look and I realized that it was actually pure white light coming from behind me. And I I focused in on this pure white light and I, I recognized that it was coming from a being, from a single being, and that it was a man. And this man is, is dressed in all white. He's got white long hair, white beard, and the most beautiful eyes like staring through me and i'm not a guy that that notices other guys eyes but i'm telling you like the most beautiful eyes and and to me it was like it felt like it was god's eyes even though he told me he wasn't god i felt like it was god's eyes in him that i was connecting to and the first thing i did ask was are you god and he laughed and he he shrugged it off and he's like no son i'm not god and as a follow-up, I, you know, as an evangelical, I had to ask, well, are you Christian? Are you Christ? And are you Jesus the Christ? And he, 
he immediately responded, no, son, I'm not Christ. And I, I was like, well, who are you? What are you? And he, he said, I'm your guide. I'm here for you. And he gave me like the second wave of this love. And it just, it started to melt who I was and who I, I thought I was. It like peeled away all these layers of who I believed I was. And he explained that he was here on a mission to be my guide, to help me go where I wanted to go. And I could go back to my life, to my, my physical realm, the physical realm here on earth. Or I could go with him and see what's next for me. See what's next in my journey of existence. And, and what's next for a lot of us in our journey of existence. And so I obviously did not want to go back. Like to even think about going back to that painful situation, it looked horrible. It, it literally looked like hell, what was going on around that body. And I said, no, I don't want that. I want to go with you for sure. Mm-hmm. Whatever this energy is that you're, you know, you're this love feeling that I've never felt before. I want more of this, whatever that is. I want to go towards that. And so he said, well, I can take you where that, that is home. And he explained to me that this is going to be a journey that is, is not just a journey of distance, but a journey of understanding and enlightenment that I had to really embrace some new understandings to be able to go to this new place. And, and I asked if, if it was heaven and he said, yes, it's a heaven. And, um, I said, well, good. I, I already can get in because I'm Christian and I'm baptized and, and, you know, I've been through, uh, you know, I've taken on Christ as my savior and and my Lord, and I I can get right into heaven. And he just, he, he gave a loving laugh and said, and said, son, that is beautiful. And I love that you have done this, but we have a little bit more we have to learn before we can get there. And he explained that, that this first step was going to be kind of the hardest, but I had to learn how to be authentic. And that's something that we think we know in this world, but we don't know. Our, our true authenticity is a weaving together of all of our aspects of who we are to one common core of who we are. And peeling away all the outside superficial layers or personalities or, or perceptions of our personality that we allow to be built around us as we grow up and we raise ourselves and, and we, we allow the world to see who we are. And he showed me that when I would go to work, I would allow a certain version of myself to be seen. Mm-hmm. Then at home with uh, my girlfriend um, at the time, I, I would... I was allowed to, I would allow a different version to be seen. And then I'd go to my parents' home and I would allow a different version to be seen. And when I was with my brother or my sisters or, or other friends, I had different versions that could be seen, but none of them were the same version. I literally was almost like a chameleon where I was showing a different version or a different color of my personality wherever I went. And it was like a survival mechanism. And I've learned since that a lot of us do this. Yeah, we wear masks. We do. We put on these masks. And and what he did is he taught me how to peel away these masks and see who is really looking back at me in the mirror and and see myself for my true authentic self. And and where you can see that is where you spend your, your energy with your decisions, with your intentions. And that's who you can see who you really are. So he showed me that, you know, that authenticity is the number one most important thing for us first, because if we can't be authentic, we can't grow. And it's kind of like he had to tear me down to the foundation of being, of beingness for me to be able to build myself to heaven, to, to regain who I am uh, originally to get myself to heaven. And so that's where my journey began. And, um, it was a three-day journey, literally three days. I was brain dead in a coma wow. in the hospital. And for three days, I journeyed with, with my guide. His name was Drake. He told me his name is Drake. And he was, he's there to, to lead me along the way. Yeah. And it was an absolutely amazing journey. What did you see when you, 
when you got there? Like, what did it look like? What did it feel like? We have all these ideas of what heaven is. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just curious, what was your experience? So the way he showed it to me is there's one original point of creation. Like if you looked at the center of the Big Bang or the center of the expansion of where life began, that's where our original home is. That's our real heaven. And that's kind of the core of all creation. That's where our creator exists. And that's that's the heaven, like the primary heaven. But he showed me, though, that there is alternate spaces around the outside that those who are not ready for that that enlightenment, that level of love, that they have these other places they can go, um, that they're like heavens. They are. And that's what he referred to them as heavens. But they're not the, the core. They're not the the creator space um, where our creator is and heaven is a, a planet like literally a planet but way bigger than our earth way bigger than our sun and you can fit multiple suns inside of this planet it's huge and as we were approaching it i noticed this mist this this almost like a wide band of cloud around the outside not like not like saturn where where the rings are flat like that it was actually wide like a wide belt around the outside as we got closer I asked Drake, I'm like, what is that? Is that a cloud? Is that a huge storm going around heaven? And, and, and he's like, notice that it's not moving. It's not a storm, but I'll show you what it is. Like he showed, he instantly brought my consciousness boom in, and brought me close to one of these, these orbs. And, you know, as you stepped back, all these orbs blended into almost like a mist. But if you really got close to these orbs, they were big orbs of light. And inside those orbs were souls. And these souls were just cleansing themselves of negative thoughts, especially victimhood, different Mm -hmm. forms of being a victim. And these are not, these are not real victimhood necessarily. These are like self justified victimhood, which is different. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I got to see this one gentleman that he was from probably the late 1800s, very early 1900s. So, um, you know, from the early 20th century, essentially the turn of the 20th century, and he, he was very upset at, a, at his son, and he was speaking Italian. Um, I, I had a very strong sense he was from the United States, like as an immigrant, a first-generation immigrant to the United States. And he was just chewing out his son in Italian uh, for betraying him. And how could you betray someone you love like this? And, and just going off. Even though he's speaking Italian, I could understand what he was saying. And... He got to the very end of what felt like a very long sentence that was, he was probably dragging out of him for like almost a hundred years, like just getting this energy off of him. He finally got to the end of that sentence and took this big breath, like, and then he looked around and he started realizing that he was not in the space he thought he was in. And he noticed that he was surrounded by light. And as soon as he noticed that, all of these angels came around him and then they escorted him into the actual heaven, into the, you know, the actual creator space. He had to just cleanse himself of this negative victimhood to be able to get there. And, and what's funny is years later, someone's like, wow, so those orbs are like pearls. Could that be the pearly gate? And I'm like, Oh, of course that's the pearly gate. I never <laughs> thought of it like that, but it is, it's like an energetic gate or an energetic filter that allows us lovingly to go into a safe space of love to cleanse ourselves of these negative energies so that we can get into heaven uh, when we're done, when we're ready. And everybody's on their own path and, and nobody's being pushed. It's all free agency through the whole thing. It's hundred percent agency everywhere we go there. We get to go as far as we feel we deserve to go. And then some, we get to go further than we deserve feel that we deserve to go for sure um all the way across the process that like grace takes you further than you would allow yourself to go you know religion tends to to teach us that you know god is like this man kind of like santa claus with a naughty and nice list you know keeping track of everything and then if you don't make the list then you go to this place called hell where there's like a you know, a devil with horns and stuff. Uh, speak to that. What do you know about that? Were you shown anything so like that? I was. Um, one of the, I was given uh, symbolism and given stories to help myself under. You know, Drake showed me a lot of things to help me understand how much the Creator loves us. 
Mm. And um, one of the examples that that I have learned to equate to all this, to what I learned, was, um, you know, many people in religions, I always ask very religious people, do you think God loves us more than we could love our own kids? And could, can God love better than we can? And every single time they say, yes, absolutely, God loves better than we could. And I say, okay, well, let's, let's imagine you have five kids. How many of them are you going to throw away? And the answer to that is none. If you love your kids as a human parent, as a human mortal parent, with imperfect love, are you going to throw away your kids? Even one of them? Never. No, never. So how is it that how is it that we sit and think that there's this, this father in the sky that's going to throw away part of his kids? He's not ever, ever, not a single one. He's got a path and a plan for every single one of us. But our father loves us. Our creator loves us so much that he's created a fast track plan, a slow track plan, a middle of the road plan. I mean, literally every single one of us gets what we need. That's what this is all about. You know, a lot of religions teach us that we come to earth as a courtroom, but it's not. It's an absolute classroom. Mm. We're here to learn. We're here to learn to foster good intention and good creation. And the way we do that is we start with our thoughts. We start with our actions. That's where we create first is we create with our thoughts and then with our actions. And from there, we, we start fostering and learning how to create in a healthy, um, beneficial way to, to God, to the universe, to the world, we actually start learning how to create. And that's what this is all about. Because when we were around God, before we came to earth, everything God wanted, we wanted. We were in sync with God. We were, we were at such close proximity to the creator. That love is so strong that the creator has for us. That everything the creator wanted, we wanted. But yet the creator wanted us to have our own choices, our own decisions, our own abilities to create. And just like kids who stay at home and never go to college or never move away from home, it's very hard to grow up that way. It's very hard to grow up that way. Mm -hmm. One of the quickest ways to grow up is to step away from home and to learn how to make decisions. And we learned that on earth, and that's how it is there too. We had to step away a far distance and step through this this mist called the veil where we were a veil of forgetfulness so that we couldn't even remember the love we have for the creator. Because even that love is so strong, it would prevent us from making unbiased, free decisions. And it's so important for us to make a free agency type decision every single day for ourselves so that we can figure out where we are on our own path with the creator and our own progress with the creator. Because again, this is a classroom or a gym for us to work out our spiritual agency, our spiritual muscles so that we could move forward for what's next and what's next. We, it's different for everybody, different for everybody. What's next. Did Drake, show you why there is suffering on this planet absolutely yeah i had a hard time with that i have a i had an uncle that he was alive back then and uh, he was a kind of self-proclaimed atheist because he felt there couldn't be a god if there was allowed so much suffering around the planet um but the first things first if you understand the love that is behind the curtain, the love that has created this universe for us, the love that makes it function, the love that draws us back to home. When you understand that love, you understand that there's no amount of suffering that we can go through here that isn't worth that love. So that's, that's the foundation of why we're here. We're, we're here literally on that love. And once you understand that, you understand that there is no amount of suffering for any of us or, or you know, individually or, or collectively, there's no amount of suffering that's not worth doing so that we can get back to that love. Number two, if we start restricting our agency, 
we restrict our ability to grow. So it is paramount that we have complete free agency. And in, in having free agency, there's going to be the ability to do harm to others. That's part of having free agency. Mm -hmm. But in the opposite, you have the ability to do great things for others. But take away one and you take away the other. They come together. Just like the yin and the yang, they come together. Mm -hmm. The good comes with the bad. That in even the darkest night, there still will be light. And in the lightest day, there still will be shadow. There's, there's balance in the universe before us, before we existed, that balance was there. And it's all understanding and using that balance to help us grow. And once you understand that, it does make it easier. Now, does it make the suffering easy for us? No, because we live under a microscope. We're living under the five minutes, 10 minutes, five years, 10 years of the suffering that we experience. And it's hard to step outside that suffering and see the glory of the universe that was built around us for us to help us grow. But if you can step away from that, and I can say that being a victim of abuse, an extreme victim of abuse, mm. that, that that suffering served a purpose. The same way that when you grind metal, you can make a sword. But without the grinding, you can never get a sword. Without the heating and the tempering of the metal, you can never get that sword. Right. Every challenge is an opportunity to grow. Absolutely. And, and the other thing that's kind of hard for people to understand, because you do have to step outside your life to understand this perspective. But before our life began, before our life here began, we were given the opportunity to volunteer for our obstacles, volunteer for our suffering. And we willingly did it. And it's, it's hard while living here under the microscope of mortality of the physical third dimension to, to really understand why someone would volunteer to go to a, a concentration camp or why they would volunteer to be hit by a car only to suffer for an hour and die. Or, you know, it, it's really hard for us to, to figure that out. But what's really amazing, though, is through God's love, the creator's love, the more you connect to that love, that force, you can actually start understanding. I know why I suffered as a victim in my life. I know unequivocally why, but I had to connect to that love first. And I didn't learn it from my experience. I learned after my experience, I had to connect to that love to figure it out for myself. And, and you know, we can all do that in our own way and find out, uh, find direction in our own lives. Why we would, we would volunteer for a suffering like this. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it, that lands with me, but I know a lot of people would struggle with that. Um, well, especially if you're in the midst of right. suffering, mm -hmm. you don't ever want to think you would volunteer for this. Right. And I can say going through some extremely hard times in my life, I would, in, when I was in the midst of that, I would not want somebody to come up to me and say, you volunteer for this. No way, shape, or form would I want to hear that. As a victim, I would never want to hear that. Um, but yet yeah, it doesn't change what it is. Right. That there's a love greater than our greatest victimness. And that's the love of the creator for us. How does it work with all of these different religions? There's one, I feel like there's one God. There's so many different ways, so many different religions. Um, can you speak to that? You know, pastors and ministers in different religions, imams, um, and, and different leaders in different churches will tell me. God sent his leader to earth to save this one specific congregation and only the elect of that congregation are saved. But I want to, I want to tell you a different story that God, the creator, which is larger than most religions could ever explain to you who is the creator. To even call the creator him or her is absolutely asinine. Mm. It's like walking up to a rock and asking, is it a Ferrari or a Lamborghini? It's neither. God is so much greater 
than anything that we could ever understand. And God loves us so much that he planted inspiration and representation all over the world in different eras. Mm. So that at, at no living time was there a space that didn't have his presence. Even in the most ignorant times, the darkest times, his presence was still there. It was just buried deep inside our hearts. But the, the holiest temple that we can ever go to to meet God is not outside ourselves. It is inside our temples right here. Mm -hmm. That is the most holy place that we can find God. And we have to find God there first before we could ever see where God is outside ourselves. I believe that. that makes sense. That makes so much sense. Thank you for sharing that. That really lands with me. I love that. So let's talk a little bit more about Drake. Um, he's your guide, your spirit mm -hmm. guide. How many guides do we have? So all of us, all of us that are, are living just an average life have a minimum of two or three. Mm -hmm. um, those who are living a more high frequency life have teams. They have teams for their teams. They've got whole teams working for them, helping them. It's hard for us to really understand or digest this, how this happens and how this works. But there's teams of ancestors. There's teams of angels. There's teams of representatives representing the God side or the, or the family side, the familial side. Um, but all of us have guides, all of us. Even the most evil people have guides. It's just they, they get less and less the more we turn towards darkness. Because darkness is distance from God. That's mm -hmm. all it is. Yep. And there's no judgment on that. People, some people, for them to grow, they need to get even more distant from God. Mm -hmm. But to me, to me, now that I know who the creator is, I want to connect to the creator the best I can every single day. And one of the, the techniques I was taught was to honor my hour of power. And my hour of power is the 30 minutes before I go to bed and the first 30 minutes when I wake up. Be very cognizant of what you put in that space. Because what you put in that space is framing your life. And you can call it a religion. You can call it an, a, a strong influence, whatever you want to call it. But I'm telling you, what you put in that space is going to influence your thoughts more than anything. And if you want to control your thoughts, control your hour of power. And that's the beginning stages of where you can start controlling your thoughts and controlling how you create. And then, of course, breath work, breathing, 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 deep thinking, just think, just allow yourself thinking time, thinking space, meditating, if you want to call it that. But um, it's so important for us to understand that we are so much bigger than our experience here. Step away from the video game of life for a moment. Step away and recognize that you are a spiritual being having a physical journey here on earth mm -hmm. and understand that your mind is the referee between your physical self and your spiritual self and that you have those three aspects to who you are. And when we get confusion, when we get anxiety in life, it's when those three aspects of who we are are not in unison with each other. Our lower self is not honoring our spirit. Our physical self is not honoring our spirit. Our mind is choosing one side or the other and not mediating between spirit and body. And once you understand that divine relationship of those three distinct essences of who we are in this space of the third dimension on earth, once you understand that, you can better empower yourself uh, of how to help yourself grow, how to help yourself get out of your own way with whatever you want to do with your life. I know that Drake gave you some profound lessons, and I was wondering if you yeah. could possibly <laughs> bullet point those. I know they're probably very extensive. Yeah, I could. Um, so he gave me 10 distinct principles, and it would take me you know, hours to go over all the principles. Primarily, it's understanding that there's that authenticity is fundamental and foremost the most important thing for us, and that it does come down to um, loving each other, understanding that we can't have prejudice for each other, that we, uh, to have prejudice for each other is to have prejudice for self. 
and that for us to truly embody the love of the creator, we can't have prejudice towards any other any other people or beings or 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 entities out there. We can't. We have to have complete love of 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 all creation. And as we do that, we begin to embody complete love of self, complete love of oneself. And uh, once we can love ourselves, then we can love others. But until we can love ourselves, we can't love others. And learning the purpose of evil, because there is purpose to evil, which we already spoke on that, that for there to be an up, there has to be a down. Mm. There can be no up without a down. So the, the proverbial Jacob's ladder doesn't exist without the top, which is God, love, our creator. And at the bottom, what is there? Fear, mm. loathing, ignorance, Satan, the devil, whatever you want to put the label there. Um, but, but we can step away from the ladder and love the whole thing and say, I love the fact that I get agency to choose every day. And, and I get to be empowered by understanding that sometimes a, a mistake is actually a benefit as long as I'm learning from it. But if I don't learn from it, yeah, that's a dive. That's a dive towards the bottom of Jacob's ladder, mm-hmm. a dive towards fear, a dive towards Satan. But as long as I'm learning from it, even missteps are wins, successes for us. And that's so important for us to understand. And, you know, understanding the importance of technology and how to respect it and treat it right in your life. Because if we don't, if we don't treat technology correctly, it will literally become your God. And I promise you there's a better God than your phone. I promise you. I believe it. So it's important to really honor that hour of power and, 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 and master your relationship with technology so that you're not worshiping your phone, that you can really turn inside to your holy of holies, to your holy temple and discover God. Discover that, that inside there, you were never alone, ever, not at any single point. But when you stare at your phone all day, you feel like you're so alone. You feel like no one is there for you. But our creator's right here inside of us. Already there. We just got to connect. We got to knock on the door. How do you knock on the door if you're never looking? Mm. Yeah, check into your heart. Absolutely. Yeah, there is no separation. There isn't. Yeah. But yeah, that's, I, th- I think I summed up most of the dead principles there. But, but uh, yeah, I actually ended up learning. I, after I came out of my coma, after three days in a coma, brain dead, I came out of it. I realized that I had my experience. And months later, months, months later, so this was in January of, 20, of 2003. And the, the following July of 2003, I'm in Wyoming. I'm watching this presentation of a town where they're giving the history of this little town of Wyoming and Afton, Wyoming, of all places. It's one of the only little uh, antler arches you'll find in Wyoming. There's only two of them there. And um, I'm learning about the town. And a lot of my ancestors were founders of the town. And up comes a picture of Drake. (laughs) And I I knew it was him. I couldn't say a word. I couldn't say a word. But I knew it was him. And right below his name, or right below his picture on this, this big big slideshow of what who the founders of the town were was this name it said charles d kazare and i knew my grandmother was a kazare but i didn't remember ever hearing about anyone named charles or 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 charles d kazare so i went to her the very next day and i asked my grandmother i said grandmother uh grandma you know do you ever know anything about a charles kazare are we related to them and uh, she goes, oh, you mean great grandpa Drake? I, I could tell you stories about him. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> and after that, I just, I get melted. I start crying. She's like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and I'm like, I, I have to tell you a story, but I can't tell you right now. Um, wow. But, yeah. Uh, about, a, what is it? This was July. And then the next October, the very, the very next October, like three, four months later, I got the opportunity to go move in and take care of her. 
at the end of her life because she's she's in her 80s and, and getting up there and and she needed somebody to either move in with her or or she needed to move into a home and she didn't want to go into a home so me and, me and my new wife that we had just been married we moved in there to take care of her and my wife was able to find and discover this really special blessing the special prayer that was said for for drake in his physical life and it talked about his purpose on earth and that he had a great purpose on earth but his greater purpose was going to be his job after earth after death and it talked about one of his main purposes was to be an escort to to take his loved ones and those who needed him from this side the physical side to the eternal to heaven wow. and it was just amazing man it was amazing because now here was complete confirmation to me of what i experienced that it was real because up to this point it was debatable it really was because i i had a neurologist his voice in my head mm -hmm. just telling me that this was my my neurology trying to fill in the gaps just making things up but I, there was no possible way I could have grasped the experience of Drake. And not just that, the love that he channeled. And I say channeled because it wasn't just his love. It was the creator's love that came to me as he first poured it over me and cleansed me in the beginning of my experience. And there's no other way that I, there's no possibility that even the analytical side of my brain couldn't couldn't justify that that was even possible. So finally, I had to start coming to terms with the fact that I had died and gone to heaven and had my whole experience. And so it's it it took a few years, and then I started sharing it with those who I felt prompted to share it with. Mm -hmm. And I was sharing it for about twelve years when finally, one of my great friends said, "Hey, you need to get this into a book." And people have been asking me to put it into a book for years. And so um, I did. I finally, we, it took a couple, few, two, three years. We got it put into a book. And that's, that's what led, us, led me here today to talk to you. <laughs> What's the name of your book? Yeah, it's called The Light After Death. The Light After My Death. My Journey to Heaven and Back. Yeah. And where, where can we find your book? So you can find it uh, on Amazon. It's also on Audible and Kindle. Uh, it's in the United States on Amazon, but on Audible and Kindle, it's international everywhere. And um, yeah, eventually we're going to have distribution for the physical book, the tangible book um, uh, internationally. But for right now, it's just domestic for the United States. Anybody who's interested, they can find it there. Or they can also, I have my own website. It's called Living God's Light. And I feel really called to a movement, a gathering of souls per se a gathering of like-minded souls who want to build their light in their own lives. And, um, and you can be any religion to, and, and it's, and it's free to join, just sign up and join the, the email list. And, and we, we hold regular um, events where we do Q and A's and we do zoom sessions and meditations and prayers. And um, it's a way that, uh, people can understand there's a lot more going on behind the scenes that they have no idea that's there for them as resources and opportunities to connect to God um, through your religion. If you have it, if you don't have a religion, then, you know, call it the universe, call it whatever you want. God still wants to connect to you no matter what name you throw on him or her or the creator, whatever you want to association you want to put there. But I tell you that the creator wants to connect to you. So we are trying to foster a better ability for people to create a, a better relationship with the creator for themselves. And uh, that's what livinggodslight.com is all about, is, is building that connection, fostering that connection with the creator and through light, which to me, that's love. Light and love are, are synonymous to each other there on that side of things, on the real side of things. Light and love is the same thing. Wow. So this really has changed you. Like you're, you're walking the walk now. Absolutely. And, and, uh, again, I go back to some, some people that are, you know, were friends with me before and, and, and still friends with me now, which I don't have a lot of those original friends still around, but, um, yeah, that they say that it, I am different and, and I, I'd hope to be too, because my priorities completely changed, uh, family and, and relationships are the most valuable things to me now. And, um, 
that was probably the least valuable to me before. What was more valuable is maybe my car, my job, my my career or whatever, you know, back then or my body. Cause I was a bodybuilder, but, um, but no, definitely the people, the relationships, we get to take those relationships with us when we cross over, but we don't get to take our cars. We don't get to take our jobs. We don't get to take our, our fancy clothes. We don't get, we don't even get to take our jewelry. <laughs> the only thing we get to take is how well we learn to create and, and in doing so, what relationships did we create or build while we were here? That's, that's the wealth we get to take with us. And to me, that's the most important thing. And always will be. Always will be. Vinny, a couple more questions before I let you go. Did you notice any like abilities or gifts when you came back um, that you didn't have before your NDE? So I... I you know, most abused kids are actually empaths. That's why a lot of them suffer with depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I was an abused kid. So I, I had that. I had the, the, the empathetic nature to myself. I, I kind of always had a second sense of when someone was hurting, I just knew it. I just didn't, I never did anything about it. But my experience taught me to kind of go to a whole nother level with that that when I do experience that others are suffering to reach out to, you know, um, do what I can, where I can. And, and beyond that, I do have just certain knowings that come to me and it, it is through my team of guides. I still work with my guides every day. It's really funny with your guides and with your spiritual team, with your ancestors, your loved ones who are there helping you. Um, the more you listen to them and the more you recognize it's their voice, or their energy helping and influencing you, the stronger it gets. So it's very important for you to recognize it, identify it, and and com and regularly confirm it that oh, I recognize that wasn't me. That you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's someone was telling me the other day they were driving down the street out of nowhere. They got this 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 like pulling. They they exited on the wrong exit, not their normal exit. Mm -hmm. They didn't know why. They just did it. They're like, why did I do that? They got back on the freeway, and as they got back on the freeway to get on the right exit, there was a big accident that literally had happened just right then. And they were explaining to me how they felt their team had led them off the wrong exit, almost like the mistake was on purpose, and it was. And, um, and the confirmation of that, when they said it, just to even say that, that helps um, strengthen that connection with his, you know, his own team. And um, we all have guides. We all do from the best of us to the worst of us. We all have guides mm -hmm. so we can reach out to them uh, and love them and, and foster a better connection with the creator through them. Cause it, they are working under the creator's stead under the creator's um, ministry of us essentially, or love of us that's how they're able to function it's it's the creator's love god's love is how they're able to connect to us and get us messages so that's that's what you have to foster and build in your own life before you can um you know better understand it or connect to it and it's like learning a new language you know to 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 be able to recognize and to hear it and to feel it and to know it um but you gotta quiet the mind the distractions have you do to go it. away and it it's funny. It's one of the lessons I teach um, regularly is in the process of trying to connect to your guides. Don't, don't just ask for help and then go about your day. That would be like going up to a drive through restaurant, ordering your food, and then just driving home without picking it up. Like after you order the food, you go to the pickup window, you wait until it's delivered, and then you go home. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's very important for us in working to reach out to God and to the creator and, and getting those messages and understandings, reach out and then wait with expectancy, with love and receive what comes, receive what comes. If nothing comes, then okay, maybe next time, but at least give that space and time for receiving. And if you don't, it's again, it's like driving away from the, the fast food window without your food, mm. you know, yeah, Pull up to the window, wait for the, wait for the receiving. Vinny, is there anything else that you would like to share before we uh, part ways? Well, the one thing I love to share every time 
in, that I do an interview or, or discussion about my experience is, is everyone needs to know who comes across this, that you're coming across this for a reason. Uh, number two is that the reason is that, that God, the creator of the universe, loves you, the individual coming across this. And that that love is, is very strong for every single one of us. And that when you understand the vastness of life in the universe, that we are the kings and queens of that life. As humans here, we are the kings and queens. And that if you could fully embody that knowing of how important and valuable you are, you would probably make different decisions daily. And I want to invite you to reach out, say a prayer, meditate, connect to God through love, and, and God will connect to you. That's a guarantee I have. God will connect to you as long as you can use love to connect to God, because that's the, the medium of how we connect to our creator is love. And uh, yeah, that's, you know, you are loved. That's the most important thing I can share today. You are loved. What a perfect ending to such a great interview. Thank you so much, Vinny. I really, really appreciate you. I love your heart and everything you had to say. Thank you so much for taking time with me today. Yeah, absolutely, David. My pleasure. And I love, uh, I love that when we can do this, we can help people connect better to God. That's an amazing thing. It really is. And, and to do so without calling it a religion and to do so with, you know, allowing someone to connect to God in their religion or outside their religion. It's a beautiful thing because God wants that connection with us. So thank you for what you're doing. And it's a beautiful thing that you're doing. So <laughs> Thank you, Vinny. Thank you. Well, happy new year too. Happy it's going to be a great new year. 2023. Yes, it is. There we go. All right. <laughs> Take care, Vinny. Have a good one, David. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.